Hi, my name is Ira Sachs, and I'm the co-writer and the director of a film called Passages, which is playing at Panorama here in the Berlin Alley. Um, the film is the story of a German film director living in Paris with his husband, um, who, and, and in brief, it's about the relationship uh, he has with a young school teacher, a woman played by Adele X. Arkopoulos, and how that relationship um, creates a, a cauldron of trouble between these three people and three characters and three actors, one of whom is played by Franz Rogalski, who plays the German director, and his husband Martin is played by Ben Wishaw. And uh, they're all really amazing, the three actors. So enjoy the film. Quand nous chanterons le temps des cerises Et guerre au signal et mère le mot cœur Seront tous en fête Les belles auront la folie en tête Et les amoureux du soleil au cœur Quand nous chanterons Le temps des cerises sifflera bien mieux le merle moqueur. <coughs> you make me shy. I think I'm falling in love with you. That's a lot, I imagine. I say it when I mean it. You say it when it works for you. I say it when I feel it. Hi, welcome to the Teddy TV. My name is Jean-Boy Bobak, and this time we are talking about the film Passages with director Ira Sachs. Hi, Ira. Hi. Welcome to the Teddy. Thank welcome you. to the Berlinale. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here with us. It's a Before we get into the film, um, you already won a Teddy Award a few years back for Keep the Lights On, right. and quite a few of your films have been part of the Teddy journey at the Berlinale. Over, over the last um, decade. Um, can you tell us a bit about how did you feel winning this award and mm. what, maybe in a more general sense, what does it mean for a filmmaker to win a queer film prize? Um, well, I guess first, just my relationship to the Berlin Alley uh, and specifically to Panorama. Um, you know, it's a kind of uniquely welcoming um, mm. section, I would say section of a right. festival yeah, uh, yeah, right. and, 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 and in the sense as a queer filmmaker who makes queer films, um, I have felt very welcomed here for the course of my career um, and that has sort of, it gives you a sense of possibility mm. when you uh, um, feel that someplace the work that you're doing has a kind of charge um, yeah. with the audience and and um, I think winning the Teddy, well that film Keep the Lights On I made after a kind of low period where I wasn't able to make any films for mm. three or four years and I really like it was through a group of, of people and, and queer supporters and queer people <laughs> that I was able to make this film really from hand like and yeah. and it was just a group of us who decided we'd get together and raise this money and then make this very personal work so to have it um, embraced um, is is really meaningful both in the moment and in the sort of after effect of feeling like something you're doing um, has value mm -hmm. uh, and value is a something I think as queer filmmakers that we we need it's it's not just personal so it's also not just economic it's all sorts of things and the Teddy represents some of that for me right and it was also kind of a full circle since the Teddy makes a cameo appearance in in Keep the Lights y On yes I. I forgot that. I had been to Berlin in 2000, 
um, five, which was a high point for me, uh, and at the festival um, with a film called uh, Forty Shades of Blue, which was a high point for me on a personal. Mm -hmm. I did not win the Teddy with that film, um, but it was also a really low point for me on a personal level in terms of the relationship that I was in at the time, mm -hmm. which then becomes part of Keep the Lights On. So highs and lows. Yeah. <laughs> right now is a good high. <laughs> I have okay, to say, I'm, I'm in a in a different place um, personally than yeah. I was. Not necessarily when I when I came here with Keep the Lights On, but when I came here in the 2000s, I, I was um, yeah I was suffering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to I put see. It lightly. <laughs> well, but it's good that you were Sorry. able to turn it into something productive and and creative. Y yeah, yeah. I also think it's kind of interesting. That I think that that the the suffering that I was going through was was both personal and generational as a, mm -hmm. as a gay man. It was not something unique. Um, I think that there was. Um, yeah, there was a lot of things that we were dealing with in those mm. times. Yeah, let's turn towards passages. Uh -huh. um, it's interesting the the film tackles questions of intimacy, of relationships, um, the ups and downs, highs and lows yeah. of relationships. And this is something that is a recurring theme um, in your career and uh -huh. in your filmography. Yeah, I was wondering in how do you see passages fitting into this lineage um, of your filmmaking and what what new angle does it bring um, into this questioning of these dynamics? Sure, interesting. Um, I had a conversation recently with my mother because people have been writing about passages. I, I describe the film as a very personal film mm -hmm. and some people have interpreted that as meaning it's a, it's a particularly autobiographical film, okay. which my mother was concerned about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> given, I see, yeah. And, <laughs> and it, I would not, this is not my most autobiographical work, right. but it, it, it is one of my most personal works and I would say that's because I really felt freedom when I was making it and writing it and um, thinking about it and um, to to be my full self as an artist in a way that seemed post pandemic very free. Mm -hmm. I felt like there's nothing to lose. Like who knows <laughs> what's going to happen in our lives and in our world, and to make a film. So in many ways, it felt most essentially me um, as a filmmaker in terms of the aesthetic and how I approach the story. Mm -hmm. I think I've often been. I mean, my films of um, the continuity. I would say is an interest in what, um, what, what white men in power do with that power mm. and, and some questioning of myself and um, in that role yeah. as someone who sits here in this chair um, and, and what, um, how, how I manage and what, what I expect for myself um, in a way that's, that's, that's maybe allegorically um, Addressed by the character of of Tomas um, yeah. as a as a director with power, yeah. and so those are is interesting to me. I think also the continuity is that this is a, a triangulated mm -hmm. film, and I think m almost most, I guess maybe the majority of my films have been about triangles, about love, yeah. about um, what sort of happens. And I think for me. That's mostly because I think it's really dramatic. I think it's a dramatic mm. construction that reveals a lot about individuals. Yeah, right. So, as you said, it's about a triangle. There are three main characters that the story revolves around. Yeah. Um, let's imagine that we are in a in a in a I don't know party type of situation where you would um, need to introduce these three people. What would you say about them? Ah, uh, um, well, the film centers on um, a, f a, a, a German film director, his husband, um, and a woman, a young school teacher, um, mm -hmm. who the, he begins a relationship with, um, and and then it sort of goes from there to be about the three of them and their competing desires. I mm -hmm. would say. Um, how their desires never seem to align, and that disalignment is really where the where the drama comes. Mm. How was the casting process, and how did you find these three extraordinary actors for yeah. for the main parts? Um, I saw Franz Rogalski in a film by Michael Haneke mm. called Happy, Happy End, End yeah. 
Yeah, and I remember exactly where I was sitting, like which when I watched that movie, yeah. um, one of my favorite Hanukkah movies, actually. And um, and when I saw, I've done this often in my career. When I see a certain performance, I feel really connected to and excited by and turned on by and curious. And I and I can imagine that that would be an interesting collaboration. So so my co-writer Mauricio Zacharias and I we wrote the film for Franz. Okay. Um, he was in our mind. He was, as were some other people that we knew, <laughs> uh, but not other actors. He was the only actor in our mind. Um, other film directors maybe inspired us to some oh. extent in the creation of the character. So I wrote the film for Franz, which doesn't mean that Franz, uh, before I'd met him or spoken to him. So he was yeah. a form of inspiration, and then he decided that he wanted to do the film, and, and, and so we proceeded from there. Ben, you know, it's actually, um, I'm not there. The Bob Dylan film, yeah. and and also a performance in The Crucible mm -hmm. um, that I'd seen him in on stage. That I felt a kind of um, amazing fluidity as an actor. Yeah. Um, ben is a super interesting person because there's this modesty to him in person, um, which somehow gets erased in the moment of performance. He's transformed. Mm. Um, yeah. He's a being in a, in a different way. When he starts to act, he turns on something that is um, uh, quite er amazing and original and super, super fine, I would say, like the finesse of his performance. And then Adele, um, I saw in a movie called Sybil, Sybil mm -hmm. and I had um, never seen her in a movie before. Yeah. So I'd never seen, I still have never seen Blue as a Warmest Color. And when I saw Sybil, she had a small part in this film, and I said, um, who is that woman? <laughs> yeah. I was just really, com you've seen the movie? Yes, I have. You're one of the few yes. people I've met who's seen yes, that film. I have seen it. It indeed wasn't like a very large part, but, uh, but I see, I see why you zoomed in on her. Yeah. In that film. Yeah. So I was just like, I literally walked out of the theater and I was like, who is that? And someone said, oh, she's the woman from blue is the warmest color. And, and, mm. um, and so, so when the film was, we, we set the film in Paris, she was the first person we went to. Yeah. And, and I, I, I kind of, you know, they say casting is directing, and but I did a good job. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Meaning I got these three amazing people. No, for sure. Yeah. That, that's absolutely true. Uh, but then from what I hear from you, probably it didn't play such an important role that all of these three actors are, for people interested in queer cinema, are, queer cinema are recognizable faces. Uh. They all have been in recent productions yeah well this was I, I cast Franz before the great freedom oh, okay so yeah. I'm not so I but but I I knew yeah. he was sexy so yeah. <laughs> I had seen enough yeah so I knew that he had appeal and I would mm. say that um, uh, you know you're you're no no that the heritage of their of their queer work was maybe not was not part mm -hmm. of the decision, yeah. but their their viability as as movie stars was part yeah. of the decision. Certainly, yeah. yeah. So, what was your uh, aesthetic approach to to the material at the end? Um, I also heard in interviews that uh, Visconti is the innocent yeah. was quite a great influence on on the working process. Yeah. Tell us a bit about about this. Aspect. Well, the Visconti film, which is his last film, was called The Innocent, and um, it's about a, a wealthy aristocrat in in Italy who has a courtesan mistress and then and a wife, and it's a it's it's a it's a lot about the triangulation between these three yeah. characters. So it was an inspiration in terms of the narrative, in ter not in terms of the aesthetics, okay. so much um, aesthetically. Um, well, I, I um, you know, uh, many different French filmmakers, including um, Jacques Nulot, mm -hmm. um, who, you know, my cinematographer, um, uh, José de Haye, is shot um, avant Jubilee, uh, Before I Forget, okay. which is a film that I really love. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love the aesthetic of that film. Um, and so, um, uh, French contemporary cinema, and from the from the '60s to the present, is has been probably the most important for me mm -hmm. as a filmmaker that I've been very engaged with, um, continually with a director named Maurice Piala, um, who Jose and I uh, came to the decision. Uh, the common feeling that 
Pila is, is kind of the monster in the room for, okay. for me. <laughs> yeah. and, I, I, and maybe because of my relationship for her too. So, so we mm. were really engaged in a way that I've been for most of my career with, mm. with his work. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, other, you know, Jean Eustache, uh, Taxi Zoom Clo, um, mm. was, a, was, an yeah. was like, I showed the actors in my film, I was like, this is what can be done. Yeah. It's not what we did, but it can be done. And yeah. the permission that that film mm -hmm. gives us. Um, yeah. Chantal Ackerman's Je Tu Il El yeah. was an yeah. important film for me. So, I, you I know, see. I've got my language that yeah. I'm engaged in. Yeah, I see. I see the, you see the, that. the influences. Um, this... See, if it wasn't an interview of me, I would, I would want to hear more about that because I'm interested what you see when I describe those films in relationship to passages. Yeah, I mean, I think it was just this whole air of... Of, of a cinematic heritage from, yeah, from dating from around the 60s and going, but particularly 60s, 70s, 80s, and a bit yeah. like this author cinema and, and independent voices mixing together. That's what I yeah. kind of sensed okay. out of it. Okay, but good, good. Yeah. Um, this menage a trois situation that is happening at the core of the film, um, this is a very common trope in cinema as well, and I thought it was a very interesting... It's not a menage a trois. <laughs> Just to say... I mean... <laughs> it's not, I mean, I, I mean, think a going... menage means a home, so yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, but it's going, like, there is a try mm. to... Right. ...to bring it to a menage a trois, uh, yes, yes. for sure. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering that using this, this, this triangle trope then, um, um, that um, you you have like a quite interesting queer take on 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 this. I mean, there is this two men married to each other, and then all of a sudden it's a it's a woman who who brings it to a triangle right. um, at the end. Uh, can you? So I'm queering the homosexual couple, as you're saying, by adding yeah, in a, a way. Third... Yeah, right. That's interesting. Um, I hadn't thought of it. I mean, when you speak, I think about Jules and Jim. You know, I think about mm -hmm. that triangle, which was yeah. which was sort of an influence on the film. Um, yeah, is the film more queer because there's a woman involved, or is it less gay? You know, these are interesting questions of 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 um, kind of the the tension mm -hmm. of the film um, and the. Um, and the, maybe the entry point, like where people find themselves mm. in the film, gets kind of screwed up yeah. in some ways. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's maybe made more potent in a way by, or one of the things that's also a factor in that is Franz mm. as a body and as a, as a character and as a person in the film. Yeah. Um, I think uh, in a way he... He, he sells the story, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not sure I have anything to add to that, mm -hmm. but it's, an, it's a question of is the film more queer or less queer because there's a woman in it, is, is what I would yeah, ask Yeah, I think myself. it was just interesting to see in that sense that these prefabricated boxes That's are right. getting blurry um, That's right. with, with this dynamic. That's right. And I thought that was a and, an and maybe that tension. makes the makes the film generational in the sense that mm -hmm. yeah. it's 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 maybe more aligned with with a present generation who's growing up with less um, codified positions. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's. I'll use that when I talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Please. I mean, by all means. Yeah. Um, can we talk a bit about the fashion in the film yes. and and the costumes? I felt like they were very integral parts in in somehow elevating these these characters. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the different decision made and, and what was your approach to this? Sure. My, you know, I think the significant thing for me was a moment with, with my wonderful um, costume designer, uh, Hadija Zagai, was um, a decision to make the movie a movie and not a realist yeah. drama. Mm -hmm. which meant at some point there was a choice, like there was a wall of clothes that were very everyday, and then there was a wall of cl clothes that were made for, 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 for the movies and for cinema and for movie stars. Yeah. And we chose that wall. 
And, and I think that that particularly plays out, it plays out with Tomas Franz's character, certainly, but I think in some ways it plays out most with Adele's character, with mm -hmm. Agat, yeah. in the sense that she um, is from a different background than the other two characters, yeah. and she's a working person in a way that these, they are kind of more in a, in a aristocratic mm -hmm. life and to some extent, and she's more of the everyday, and yet she's dressed like Bridget Bardot. I mean, really, yes, like, <laughs> yeah. like she's made into an object that she's also, her relationship to being that object is very interesting and not totally dissimilar to Bardot, who somehow mm. owns, she, you know, you can't say Bardot is only in contempt. Um, you can't say that she's only objectified. She's also like running the show. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so no, it's, uh, so sure. I, think, I think Adele slash Agat also has that power. She's really, and, and I would say with Franz, I mean, one of the things is that, again, it's like, these are not ordinary, I hate to say that because in person they're very likable and knowable, but they're not ordinary people. Mm -hmm. um, these three actors, there's a way in which they in themselves can elevate yeah. The, the, the material and the clothes, really. Like, they can wear that stuff as, this, as if it's every day. Yeah. And most of, a lot of us can't. can't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that they, they own the clothes. Um, and then there were certain points in which the clothes are, are, were really like props in a play, mm -hmm. meaning like you put um, uh, Tomas Franz in a midriff uh, and, and leopard skin pants, and you know that's going to have an effect to the story you're telling when he walks into a room. And it is like a play, like yeah. it's an entrance of, it's an entrance of the person and it's also an entrance of the costume. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned just now that there is this difference, this class and social status difference yes. between, between the characters, also, um, also, some of the characters have like um, an immigrant background or they are not from France. So there is, right. um, there is this interesting social fabric that's kind of sweeping into the film. Um, and I was wondering um, what inspired you about this and, and how did you tackle this? Um, I'd say two things. Okay. One, I think character is defined by many things, but one of them is, is economics. Like mm -hmm. you can't really draw a, a picture of a person without somehow um, including some knowledge of their economic um, existence in the world. So it's yeah. part of character, I would say. Um, uh, even more though for me, there was this concept of power, of, of male power, mm -hmm. which included wealth, which I think both the character of Tomas and um, of Martin Ben Wishel's character um, embody, and they embody it as a couple. Yeah. And so when I think part of the vulnerability of Agat in this world is entering a world of gay male power and privilege. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the danger is. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a scene later in the film when she um, joins them in a country house and it's their house and it's their yes. friends and it's their objects, and it's their, and you know, we talked about that scene as a horror movie. It's literally a mm -hmm. horror film. It's like, yeah. we're like, don't go in the house, is, is what you wanna say to a guy, yeah. don't go in there. Yeah. And, and I think it's, uh, it plays out, you know. Yeah, yeah and it's, because it also obviously very much influences the dynamics between these three characters, and it's very interesting because in a way, it's Thomas's character that's maybe a bit more upfront to us. Maybe yes. he's a bit more in in center, and he's definitely a character that's difficult to root for mm -hmm. um, over the course of this film. Um, but the other two characters, Martin and Agat, um, they are also not completely passive. Um, objects in, in his manipulative games, that, so That's to speak. right, that's right. I, I mean, I, as you talk, I think about, in a way, the influence of Fassbender on, mm -hmm. on the film, um, and particularly Fox and his friends. Yeah. Um, and, and 
Agat being the Fassbender character mm. to some extent, who's brought into a world that is dangerous for her. Um, but as you say, she has her own, um, you know, she's, a, she's also a very strong character who yeah. has her own um, uh, position, desires. I mean, very, at the beginning of the movie, she, she knows what she's getting into. Of course she and really she, does. And she makes that choice without um, any, seemingly, any seeming compunction. I mean, or, mm -hmm. or you know, so, um, and I think that's this question of like, are we animals? Like, are we driven mm -hmm. by, and I think in general, I don't, I th you know, I don't, I don't make films with an idea of kind of that there is a moral compass, there is desire and how you, how you sort of navigate it, mm -hmm. and I think all, mm. and all of these characters are trying to figure out what they want and how to get it, and so that makes it, um, I, I think it makes it exciting, but in some ways because there's competition, yeah. um, I think it also makes it human, so. Yeah. It was also interesting to see that, and we talked about the many different influences that, um, that you had going into this project, which many, many of which really connects with the city of Paris. And mm -hmm. this story also predominantly takes place in Paris. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, it mostly uh, moves into closed domestic spaces right. and I was interested a bit about this um, this contrast between the two um, and why um, why are you so drawn to these like domestic environments um, I'm drawn to how people live in their most intimate moments together mm -hmm. and for me that tends, it doesn't just take place because it takes place, you know, you could say in a, you could set a movie in a, in a demonstration or a, or a rock concert. I mean, I'm not saying that these are the only places, but they are places that are familiar to me. They are places that are um, in which intimacy is kind of preordained. Um, they are also um, places where people are trying to establish homes. And again, part of drama is how homes are not stable. Yeah. Right. So I think that Paris is a place that I started to become very close to in my 20s um, when I lived there as a student and ha I have a lot of friends there and mostly what, where we are is in restaurants and in apartments like that's we're not at the Louvre. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> we're not at the top of the, you know, the Eiffel yeah, Tower. The yeah, 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 you know, we're, we're in people's houses and. and and so I think I've, I've, I've set most of my, fil my films have been sort of centered on domestic life. I mean, I'm also, I sort of can't but think about the novel. Like I've talked about the influence of films, but for mm -hmm. me, um, writers uh, sort of, of like writers like Henry James or Edith Wharton or these people who are mm -hmm. finding the deepest dramas in what people are doing between each other in domestic situations mm -hmm. is kind of what's drawn me to, to, to storytelling. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah. Well, Ira, thank you so much uh, for taking the time and uh, yeah. answering some questions about the film. I wish you all the best for the course of the festival and yeah, hopefully we see each other at the Teddy Award on yes. the 24th of February. Great, and thank you for these thoughtful questions. It's nice thank to you. have a real conversation about the film. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.